Hello, everyone, and welcome to the LCBO Mediterranean Wines for Alfresco Dining Tasting, brought to you by the LCBO and their trade partners. Tonight, we are going to be tasting Mediterranean wines for late summer, early fall tastings, all outdoors. That's right, enjoying these wines on your balcony, in your patio, and in your own backyard. As you taste along with us this evening, we do ask that you drink responsibly as you enjoy these wines. My name is Renee Sperazza, and I'm going to be your host this evening. I am a certified sommelier, and you might have seen me as Wine by Renee online. And I am joined by New World Wine Tours, Mackenzie Pudicy. Welcome, Mackenzie. How are you doing this evening? I'm doing super well, thank you. I'm so excited to be here and taste Mediterranean wines. I'm a big fan of traveling through this region and the cuisine that goes along with it. I couldn't agree more. When I think about Mediterranean wines and just the Mediterranean overall, I think of these sun-soaked vineyards and beautiful beaches and all this uh. wonderful scenery that my mind is just like, it's just taking me there. And uh, that's what I want to feel with these wines today. Mackenzie, yes. how many wines are we tasting today? And where are we going on our tasting? So we are tasting six wines tonight. We've got two whites, a rosé, and three reds. We're going to be starting in Greece, moving over into France, then Italy, and wrapping things up in Spain. So a true representation of what the Mediterranean has to offer. I'm so excited about that. Let's get started. Let's get into our very first wine of the evening. We're going to kick everything off with the Butari Masha Filaro White Blend. And Mackenzie, I'm going to throw it over to you because we are heading to Greece as our first stop this evening. Tell me a little bit more about this wine. I'm going to give it a good uh, whiff while you do that. <laughs> Sounds good. Sounds good. So Butari is the producer here. Uh, they've been making wine for 140 years in Greece. So they've got some experience under their belts and they really focus on indigenous Greek varietals. So, um, you know, people who are enjoying Greek wine for the first time or maybe haven't taken the dive into Greek wine. There are a lot of really unique uh, grape names and grape varieties that you can explore throughout the country. Uh, this one, the Moscho Filero, is a really delicious white, fairly aromatic. Um, oh, yeah. But still tends to be served as kind of like a dry style white wine. So very food friendly. And um, this one here comes from the Peloponnese region. So if you have been to Greece or you're looking to go, it's actually kind of a peninsula that juts southwest out from where Athens is on the mainland of Greece. And I love talking about Greek wines because when we think about Greece, we have to think that there's so many different uh, terroirs and senses of place in this winemaking region. It's also a volcanic region, so you have so much to explore. And this wine is made mm -hmm. in a very, very fresh style, so we really are getting Greece in the glass. And while you yeah. were talking about all that, all those wonderful things about Butare and Moshe Filero, I was, I, I couldn't help but get my nose into it. And I love how aromatic yeah, what are you it is. Getting? You're so right. Yeah, so I am getting these wonderful white flower and rose aromas. There's this soft yeah. tropicality to it too. What, do you, what are you getting in the glass before I continue with more of my tasting notes? <laughs> I completely agree. Like big on the florals, almost that like orange blossom, white floral, like you were mentioning. Um, mm -hmm. In terms of the, the fruit, um, it's got this almost kind of like peachy, nectary kind of character, but definitely some citrus, citrus, uh, almost like citrus rind, but grapefruity. Yeah, uh, so kind of, it really uh, is. It's grapefruity. It's got this savoriness. I yes, couldn't agree with you more. There's word. this salinity and this savory aspect to it. Like you said, we're getting really that seaside, very Greeky vibe overall. Have you tasted the wine yet? I think you're going to be blown away when you taste it. Mm. It really it comes lovely? through on the palate. It's really well balanced. Um, you know, all of those nice aromas do follow through, but you kind of get this nice, crisp, clean finish, and then you're ready to go for more or ready to grab some food and enjoy, uh, you know, 
some dinner or an aperitivo or something like that. I would definitely I agree. pair this up it's with mean. fish or seafood. Fish or seafood. Okay, so if we're pairing this this wonderful mosha fiolotto with fish or seafood, take take me to Greece with your pairing. What what do you want to pair with this specifically? I'm gonna just bug you a little bit more because I want to be able to make this dish. I, I want to make a dish that I can have at home with this wine. Absolutely. So I think white fish with this would be really great. Um, so pick a white fish. Uh, you know get it from a fisherman on the Greek shore. Uh, and then often you'll find that things are baked in like a clay um, kind of pot or, uh, you know, like a, a bowl with the kind of shorter sides. So do that with some uh, some whole tomatoes, some local olives, bit of olive oil, salt, pepper, maybe a bit of onion in there. And that'd be like a great kind of traditional dish from the area that would pair really well with this wine. I think so too, because like we were saying, there's this savory edge to it and the salinity that's going on, but these beautiful floral and almost mm -hmm. citrus aromatics, it's going to add a lot to the dish, but it's also going to catch up with that saltiness that the dish can put in there and they're going to marry together and create a really, really beautiful pairing. I love that, Mackenzie. Thanks for that wonderful pairing. <laughs> a pleasure, a pleasure. Amazing. So, so if you yeah, want this to is a fantastic this one. one. Yeah, no, it's fantastic. And if you guys at home want to give a try to this wine, we're going to tell you all where everything is from and remind you at the end. But you can find this wine, the Butari Marsha Fiolito, on the LCBO shelves. And this is a really great and affordable wine to step into Greece with for the very first time. Absolutely. So after Greece, <laughs> where are we headed, Renee? Okay, so I have, I have a great trip planned for us next. We are taking the world's cheapest plane flight, out to France. We're just going to hop over there. And we have two wines from the south of France that we are going to start enjoying. One from the Languedoc and one from Provence. Our second mm. wine up for today is actually the Felix and Lucie Sauvignon Blanc from the Languedoc region of France. And when you think about France and you're trying to picture where the Languedoc is. Think of the Mediterranean Sea, you have France, you have Italy, you have Spain, and it's really right next to the Pyrenees Mountains. So you have this region that's really affected by the Mediterranean Sea and these higher elevations mm -hmm. from the mountain itself, which create a lot of difference within the wine. We're drinking a Sauvignon Blanc today, which you would normally find in the Loire Valley of France. And this is, uh, you rarely get to taste Sauvignon Blancs from the Languedoc, but it is a grape that does wonderfully in these warmer climates. So we get to explore a different side of Sauvignon Blanc, communicating the terroir of the Languedoc. And Mackenzie, I'm gonna get you to hold up the bottle for me because there's something really sweet about this wine. You can see that the label has this beautiful heart-shaped lock. And the whole idea with Felix and Lucy is that they want to celebrate the joie de vivre of life and to share this wine with your loved ones, have a great time, and really just live life. So Mackenzie, as uh, I saw you have it in your glass and you've been smelling it, what are you, what are you experiencing in the glass so far? I'm going to join you. Yeah, absolutely. So very, you know, signature Sauvignon Blanc notes coming off of this. You get the kind of grassy herbaceous character. A slightly green note, some people will call things like asparagus or green peas, uh, but this is a warmer region. And so we are also getting some really nice ripe fruit coming through. Um, some citrus, which I find is typical of the grape, but uh, a little bit riper, almost like a, like a white peach or like a subtle melon kind of character as well there. Mm -hmm. I agree. There is there is definitely like almost like a tropicality to this. Sauvignon Blanc can bring out a tropicality to it, but it, it's really quite soft and easy. You get this almost like pineapple that's not cut yet. Mm -hmm. It's got its stems still on it. It's just hanging out. It really kind of gives that outer pineapple smell. Also a little bit of green mango in there and that those green savory aromatics really truly come through. The other thing that comes through really well is this minerality. It's almost rocky minerality, yeah. I, right? I know that as sommeliers, uh, we talk about rocks a lot and you know, people always ask me if we can actually smell it. And I think there is this mineral aspect to the wine because it, it gives almost this like seaside rocky cliffs of the Languedoc region vibe. So you've tasted mm -hmm. the wine, Mackenzie. How is it, how is it feeling on the palate? 
I agree. It's um, very dry, very crisp. So we're not, even though it's ripe and rich on the nose, it doesn't come through as a sweet wine. And uh, a lot of acidity here, which is typical of Sauvignon Blanc as a grape. Often it really kind of pops in the mouth. You almost get this like, well, you, you get quite a lot of heavy salivation. And if you are salivating a lot when you have a white wine, often that's an indication of high acid. Mm hmm. And this because I'm 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 mouth my mouth is watering so much. This is a wine that makes me want to have like this almost aperitivo vibe to it. So when it comes to pairing the Felix and Lucy Sauvignon Blanc, I start to think about these lighter snacks that you would have in an aperitivo hour or an aperitif hour, which is really common in the Mediterranean, especially in the south of France. So I would love to pair it with either sushi or also these crudos mm. that you can do with it. You can also go with some light grilled vegetables if you wanted to do something that's more vegetarian in vibe because it's a great wine by itself. But, you know, there's always a good snack that can pair with these mouth watering and refreshing wines. What do you think, Mackenzie? I agree. And you mentioned that kind of aperitivo hour. The French, especially in southern France, like in Montpellier, they love to have the aperitif. They don't eat dinner till maybe nine o'clock, 10 o'clock. So everyone congregates around maybe six or seven, has a really nice, crisp, fresh local white wine. And you get these kind of local seafood dishes like the crudo uh, oysters are very famous from this area, too. And some nice local cheeses and stuff as well. I think that would be lovely with it. We're going to go back to our Greek wine for a hot minute here, Mackenzie, because we had a question sure. come in from Vivian Ryan, who has asked okay. us, what would we pair with our Greek wine besides seafood? So I'll, I'm mm. going to let you think of it a, a pairing for that, because for the Greek wine besides seafood, I would really like to go with almost like there's grilled feta salads that are out there that I think would be really lovely with it. I'd also like to do some um, those very like potatoey dishes that they have, Ooh. or even those very classic uh, tomato salads with those onions that Greece is really famous for. What do you think, Mackenzie? Yes. I, just, I yes. think those are great pairings. Uh, just yes, let's do it. Uh, but no, those are great. I think chicken <laughs> Slovakia though as well would be really good. Like that kind of nice char on a, on a poultry or a chicken. It still mm -hmm. adds something. And then the wine is going to kind of add a good counterbalance with those fruity and floral notes. All right, let's head back to France because we are getting into our rosé of the day, everyone. And before we head there for just a hot minute, you can find the Felix and Lucy on the shelves of the LCBO stores as well. This is another wonderful wine to explore a different side of the Languedoc with. But, but let's roll into some rosé. Uh, Mackenzie, tell us a little bit about our next wine coming up today, which is the Miraval Rosé. Go ahead, Mackenzie. <laughs> Absolutely. Uh, so like you said, Miraval Rosé uh, from Provence. Provence is a region known for the rosés um, and typically really light rosé, really dry in character. And um, these are wines that you could uh, really enjoy in the hot summer weather. This one is kind of a celebrity wine. So Miraval is uh, from Brad Pitt and Angelina Jolie. Uh, but they also have consulted with local winemakers. And so they have the family Perrin, uh, which have come out to to make this wine. So it's not like Brad and Angelina are in there with the kids making the wine. Uh, they've really <laughs> recruited some top talent from the area. Uh, this one is yes. a blend of four grapes, right? <laughs> that would be good, though. Put them to kids to work. They need to. It would make a wonderful documentary. Business. It'd make a wonderful exactly. documentary, but continue to tell me the grapes that are in this <laughs> wine. <laughs> sure thing, sure thing. So all kind of local grapes to the region. There's Sanso, uh, which is a red, Grenache, and Syrah. Uh, but we've also got Roll, which is a, a white grape from the region. And I know you're Italian and you love your Italian wine and food. So Roll is also known as Vermentino in Italy. And that's the one white grape that goes into this mix. I love that. I think when people think of rosé, like they, they do think of red and white grapes blended together or red and white wines blended together. But that is a, a standard practice in Provence. You will find wines that are made from 100 percent red grapes, but you'll also find wines that are made from a red and white grape blend. And that's what we're getting in the glass. There's also something really interesting about the winemaking of this wine. I love what the Perrin family does because 
they have been such champions of Provence and uh, in the winemaking style. I think, did you dive into it already that they, they do something a little special, Mackenzie? No, I've, I've been keeping it under lock and key. Uh, this one, <laughs> they, they add a little bit of richness to the, to the, to the rosé by doing two things. One is it's barrel aged, not all of it. So it's not super oaky, but they take 5% of the, the wine, they barrel age it. And then they also age it on the lees. And the lees is basically a term we use for talking about the yeast. So after the fermentation is subsided, we typically rack the wine off, leaving the lees behind. Uh, but in this case, they're actually extending that contact with the lees to bring out some different textures and aromas, uh, like a, almost like a pastry dough or a shortbread. Mm -hmm. Sometimes it can be a bit tangy, like a pizza dough. And we get this a lot with uh, like champagnes or bottle fermented. Uh, wines as totally. Well. And I, I like to think about Lees, like I think I have a great metaphor for Lees and it's the way that I started to think about it when I got into wine, which was Lees aging to me, you have sugar plus yeast equals alcohol and they keep it on the Lees a bit longer, it adds a little something something and to me it's like a good haircut. A good haircut can change everything. It really can, it can change everything and Lees contract can add yeah, it can add so much more to a wine and it's just this little differentiation said yeah it just adds that little kind of like richness to the body maybe a little bit of like a more texture and uh and even on the nose that kind of extra bit of uh kind of that pastry that creaminess and um here you're also getting like a good amount of red fruit so think almost like strawberry i find on top of that sometimes you get like um a little bit of white peach uh is something that you might get from this wine I couldn't agree with you more. It does give that white peach vibe. You get those strawberries, you get those berries, you get that peachiness. But you also get this almost um, earthy characteristic to it. That pastry note really came out of the wine as well, which I'm, I'm really noticing a lot. And on the palate, what I like about this wine is how that Lee's contact is really getting into it. It almost has this vibe like you ate a piece of cotton candy and you know when you eat a piece of cotton yeah. candy and it kind of sits on your palate and then it just melts and it goes away. It has this roundness of texture to it, but this lean yeah. finish. It's a dry wine. It's not a sweet wine in any way, shape or form, but it has this beautiful roundness to it. So Mackenzie, with this wine, what would you like to pair with the Miraval Rosé? Ooh, loaded question. Um, I know, I'd probably right? do like summer <laughs> salads. Uh, in, in Provence and in the southern seaside, you get things like salad nichoise with the tuna. Um, I think you could do this with goat cheese or goat cheese on a salad uh, or grilled. Think like grilled veggies like zucchini or even like grilled peaches. We have great peaches in Ontario. You could get those, grill them up, and then kind of add them to your salad at the end. And uh, this would be fantastic with that. I actually make that recipe at home. I love doing grilled peaches and uh, grilled grapefruit with a little bit of Ooh. mint and olive oil and some orange zest. I think it would be a wonderful mm -hmm. pairing with this. We want to go, I'm going fresh with fresh with the wine and the food together. So I think it would be lovely. So if you guys at home are wanting to try out these wonderful pairings with the Miraval, you can find it on the shelves in the vintages section of the LCBO. And it has a really, really recognizable bottle. So it's quite hard to miss. I think Mackenzie's gonna show this for us right here. Yeah, it's got this beautiful yeah. extended burgundy bottle style. So you can always find it very, very easily. Here we go. All right, Mackenzie, are you ready to head to our next Hi location <laughs> yes all right i hear so we are it could be Yay. somewhere like italy <laughs> i think you're correct i think you're actually really right maybe because we planned the tasting um so the uh, our next stop is going to be italy for today and we are shifting gears in country but also in wine color and we are going for a red wine our next wine up for today is the fresco baldi Castiglione Chianti, and this is their DOCG production. So Frescobaldi, I have a, a really fun, fun fact for you, Mackenzie, about Frescobaldi. Did you know that they have been making wine in Tuscany since the 1300s? No, that's crazy. 
I know, right? They have. They've been making wine in Tuscany since the 1300s, and now we are in 2021, and they are wine, which is really cool. So you have them really part of the Chianti region. They're really giving that life and that part of the how Chianti is this really intrinsic region to Tuscany. Now, if you see mm -hmm. on your bottle, there's a little label if you're tasting it that says D-O-C-G. You might also see D-O-C. And if you've ever wondered what that is, it stands for Dinominazione Origine Crontolata e Garantita. And basically it is a quality seal that showcases a historical quality, that this wine was made in the style that is indicative of the region. It's going to taste like a Chianti. It's going to give you that Chianti vibe. It's made with predominantly Sangiovese. So the Frescobal di Castiglione Chianti is made with uh, Sangiovese and a little bit of Merlot. It also is done in stainless steel and there is no oak production on this. So when you see stainless steel versus oak on a red, you're really gonna get more of a very fresher style of wine that holds in mm -hmm. those fruit aromatics and those floral aromatics, plus the Merlot is in there. So I'm, I'm expecting a wine that is gonna be fairly plush in terms of its aromatics. Mackenzie, you've had your nose in the glass. What are, what are you experiencing the aromas of this wine being? First thing I got was just like big, dark, beautiful cherry notes, um, which I expect a lot of cherry from Sangiovese, from Chianti, but I think the Merlot adds this kind of extra depth of like silky plum. And mm -hmm. it's really uh, just like smooth and approachable. But it is. It's almost what a I love about wine. Italy. It is, right? Like, there's, yeah. there's always layers. There's, there's like uh, an herbal note to it, uh, a little bit of an underlying earthiness. And I think that's what makes Chianti. Uh, a region that's very food friendly. Uh, you were mentioning mm -hmm. the DOCG, and you know, often we think, oh, this is a grape of you know Merlot or Cab, but we're really buying Chianti because there's a lot that goes into it. That's all regionally done in terms of how it can be aged, what grapes you're using, um, you know, the geographical boundaries of where these grapes can be grown. And so when you when you buy a Chianti, you kind of know what to expect, and that's what's great about getting these wines. And uh, and this is definitely something that, you know, reads as Chianti for me in the glass. Me too. And it, it, Italian wines have a very Italian vibe to them. They, they really do. I have, I have an affinity with Italian wines being an Italian person myself. Uh, so I know, right? So you really get all these layers. You get this floral mm -hmm. aromatics with the violets and these fruit characteristics that are very quite flamboyant in them with the cherry and the dark plum and the blackberry. But at the same time, it's layered with spice and this depth and this complexity to it too. It's really such a beautiful style of wine. Mm -hmm. So talking about all this complexity, what would you pair uh, in terms of, say, an Italian dinner or an Italian dish that comes from the area, Renee? And you have you tasted it on the palate yet, too? You get that spice that comes into it, too, on the palate, huh, Mackenzie? With that, those layers that are coming in with the aromatics, you feel it on the palate as well, huh? Totally, totally. It's um, It's got a nice warming character to the spice as well. Like, it's, it's not over the top. It's not peppery. But it's just got this kind of, like, nice, easy uh, kind of spicy character, which I think, again, food-friendly Chianti, um, what would you do for dining with this uh, as a pairing, Renee? Okay, so Chianti is actually, it has so many options for pairing. That's the thing about Chianti. You can pair it with roasted chicken dishes. You can pair it with a bistecca alla Florentina. One of my favorite pairings with Chianti is pizza. And I love a mm. pizza with a salami di Toscana on it. But you can also do it with a margarita pizza as well. It picks up on those tomato notes, that freshness of acidity that comes out of the wine. But you also get those tannins that come through, those, those soft, silky, almost sweet tannins that make your mouth a bit dry but add a lot of character to the wine. And that pairs well with the cheese. You get a little bit more intensity with the meat coming in and matching up with those spices. Mm. Chianti is so fun because it's missing enough notes to pair with a lot of different wines. What would you pair with this? I want to hear your pairing too. Because Chianti has a lot going um, on for it. 
Like pizza's solid, absolutely. Uh, but I always feel like this area, like you were saying, there's the the bistecca, there's Parmesan cheese. But I love Bologna just next door to um, to Tuscany, and you've got this kind of spaghetti bolognese, super classic. I just feel like all those like iconic Italian foods people know and love. Chianti's just a, a surefire pairing for all of that. I, I honestly, I couldn't agree with you more. You can really go wild with Chianti and pair it with so many different things. And if you're in for trying the Fresco Baldi Castiglione Chianti DOCG, you can find it on the shelves of the LCBO. And just go wild. Try a bunch of different things with it. It would be a great wine for El Fresco dining because if you have a couple people mm -hmm. over with you to enjoy the bottle with, as you should responsibly, you can have a couple of extra dishes too. So, um, Mackenzie, where are we going next in our tasting with Italy? I think we're, we're staying in Italy, but we're going somewhere special, aren't we, next? We are. We're going to scoot on a boat. We're going to take a ferry west of uh, Tuscany and get over to the island of Sardinia. And this one, this one is the Cananao de Sardinia, and it is a Reserva by Sella e Moschica. And this is a, a grape that most people, I assume, you know, uh, excuse me if I assume, uh, but probably haven't heard of. <laughs> Cananao is not a super common grape. Uh, but actually, you might have known this by another name. Cananao is the local name for Grenache, which we see in Spain, sorry, in France, or Garnacha, which we also see in Spain. So it, it's kind of lived around this Mediterranean area. It really desires and requires a lot of heat. So we generally see this in hot, hot areas like the Mediterranean that it's uh, home to. But we're also starting to see it in places like Australia, a little bit in California, where they really have the heat units uh, required to ripen this grape up. Um, and I mentioned this is a Reserva. So Reserva in Sardinia means that it's two years minimum aging requirement and six months of that needs to be in an oak barrel. So compared to the previous wine, which didn't really have that oak signature, we should hopefully be seeing in the glass some kind of oaky notes, which, you know, when we look at oak, we might get things like sweet spices, cedar, smoke, toast, vanilla, and so on. Are you getting any of that kind of coming off the wine? Oh, uh, I sure am. <laughs> I really am. As, as you've been telling me about this wine, my... My nose has been buried in the glass. And a quick tasting uh, nosing tip for all of you guys out there. If you're smelling a wine and you want to smell more of it, keep your mouth open a little bit as you mm. smell. You're going to get so many more tasting notes going on. So I was totally getting that. It has these beautiful, like, dark fruit aromas. It's almost stewed fruit. It's so deep and concentrated. But at the same time, there is these toasty characteristics and these very sweet spices like cardamom and Thai cinnamon that's really coming into it. Mm -hmm. And you get this, this really different perspective overall. It's a bold wine. It smells bold. Yeah. It really kind of comes up and it sits on your, uh, your nasal receptors and it's like, I'm not leaving. I'm staying here. It's bold and it's happening. And I really feel that with this wine. Sardinia is also a really beautiful region. I know a couple of friends of mine that have gone out there before, and actually the story of Stella and Moshe is literally about falling in love with the region. And we have the two mm. winemakers that were started it about 100 years ago. They went to Sardinia and just never left. That's how beautiful it is, and I feel like this is communicating the heat and the beauty of Sardinia in the glass. Yeah, it's funny you mentioned that, you know, people going and never leaving. I had a friend who was backpacking through Europe when we were younger, and she was supposed to go to Sardinia for just two or three days. And then she ended up <laughs> uh, kind of working her way into a job at a local hostel so she could stay for a whole month. She just loved it so much. It is glorious there. Have you tasted the wine yet? It is. Oh, uh, this so is nice this is really nice <laughs> it's really it's like it's like a warm hug it's really it's a step mm. up here uh we're at 14 percent alcohol so it's quite warming uh and that is because of the heat right the climate uh makes riper grapes more sugar and that just brings out that kind of stewed rich really ripe fruit character that you were mentioning uh in your tasting mm. notes so the spices yeah. are great it's like really perfumed honestly 
It is. And I like how we had these very silky, softer, sweeter tannins with the last one. I find that these tannins are still sweet, but they're plush. And it's kind of like you turned mm -hmm. up the volume from these tannins that went very linearly down the palate, those things that make your mouth feel dry. The next time you have a red wine out there, everyone, try try the Chianti and try the Cananao next to each other and you'll 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 see it. You'll you'll feel it on the palate. This these are tannins yeah. that are turned up to like a hundred. They kind of blow out all over you get this sweetness and this spice that covers your entire palate and it's really really interesting how the grape is expressing itself in this very bold punchy way i love it so what do you want and to I'm pair with this surprised. one Nancy? yeah so I, i'm i think this would actually really hold up well to red meat so i think like uh grilled lamb would be fantastic mm -hmm. with this you could also do it with some other you know beef or it's barbecue season. Burgers would be great with this. But I think like, you know, a more local kind of option would be grilled lamb. Um, and you know what? I don't know if this is traditional to Sardinia, so I don't want to claim that it is. But I've had like Greek yogurts or thicker, like kind of creamy sauces with lamb in the past and and uh, and herbs. And it's just so good. That kind of interesting contrast of like creamy and salty. And then this wine's just got all the fruit and spice. I know I'm living I'm for these now. pairings right now. <laughs> I know, me too, me too. I have I have my dinner planned, which is a pairing with one of these wines. I know I'm not going to tell you guys, but I am envisioning all of these dishes that I could make with these wines. And I think that they're really great ones to try and showcase. I think a lamb is a wonderful pairing with it. I also think another really interesting pairing for this specific, the Cananao wine, there is a really rare pasta that is based out in uh, the uh, the island of Sardinia called Sufilindeo. It means the threads of the gods, and it's basically this woven pasta that's in a diamond shape. And they mix hmm. it in a almost like a chicken broth sauce. I've seen people do it with vegetarian broth sauce before, and tons of cheese tons and tons of cheese and it turns into this almost like softly warm soupy gooey but in the best way version of almost like a carbonara vibe so i think that mm. this would be a lovely wine with that dish as well and showcase a different side pairing sardinian wine with sardinian food but i love your greek pairing uh right yeah and so like if you guys what grows give it together try, goes together <laughs> i was gonna say what, right. grows what grows together, together goes, goes together, together. <laughs> It certainly does. And if you guys want to give a try to this wine, you can find the Stella Moshka on the vintages shelves of the LCBO. It's a really, really lovely wine to add into your cellar. Mm -hmm. So, Mackenzie, I'm so sorry to tell you this because I'll miss you immensely, but we're heading on our last uh, part of our trip. I'm sorry. Okay, I wish okay. I could taste wine with I'm you all sad. evening. <laughs> All right, our, our we'll last do wine, don't, sometime. we'll have to do it again sometime, I swear. Um, so our last wine of the evening is actually the Anciano Classico Granacha from Valencia. You guys heard me right. We are getting into a Granacha and we just left Cananao, which is also Granacha, but from Sardinia. So we're going to experience something different with this wine. Anciano is a really lovely producer that makes wines all across Spain. And Valencia is known for its production of Granacha. If you're picturing where Valencia is, think about Spain. Think about the Mediterranean coastline of Spain. It's really on the shores of the Mediterranean. And Valencia is actually a straight run across from Ibiza, in the Balearic Sea that's right near there. So we have this very warm, very sunny climate, like Mackenzie was saying, we get this bigger, bolder wine. The wine itself is actually a blend. So it's predominantly Granacha, but there's also a touch of Tempranillo and another very famous grape from the region of Valencia, which is Monastrel, known as Movedre mm. in France. So, and the final thing to know about this wine is that it's been aged for seven months in oak. Mackenzie, you've, you've had your nose in the glass. I, I see you with your nose in the glass over there. Um, what are you experiencing in these aromatics coming out of the glass this evening? So I think that blending with the Tempranillo and Monastrel really shows through. We're getting a little bit darker, deeper fruit and kind of like an earthiness and dark florality, which I find quite typical of Mavedra or Monastrel. Um, reminds me a little bit of Syrah sometimes in the glass. Mm -hmm. and. Um, 
we're still getting some kind of oaky characters, but it's not that same like sweet spice uh, as we had previously. It's a little bit um, more woody, perhaps. It is. It is a little bit more woody. And there's more pepper in this wine than there was before. I'm getting mm -hmm. I'm getting a lot of pepper aromatics, which can come out of a Grenache. There's also these deep stewed fruits are there too. But for me, it's more like mulberry and prune and fig. And it's very dark. Mm. It's very deep in its complexion of this fruit that's so ripe. But there's also... It, it, this is a fun and funky wine. Like it, it really feels like we went from something big and bold and, and, and yelling and vibrant. And now we've moved into that, but we've changed it a little bit and we've added a little bit more music. So it feels like I'm, I'm mm. smelling the Spanish version of flamenco in the glass. That's just my feeling at this there moment. There we go. <laughs> I was getting I there, it. I swear. I was like, how do I get from here to flamenco? I feel like this is the way to get to flamenco because it makes me want to dance. It's a very like really fun, vibrant movie kind of a wine. Have you tasted it yet? What are you experiencing on the palate? Yeah, so still dry, but quite juicy and fruity. Like you were saying that that again the hot climate really results in these riper juicier fruit characteristics tannins are there and they actually tend to build my first sip i was like oh they're not too big but they actually have a good presence it's more fine grain tannin though and um i think it's a pretty well-rounded versatile red yeah, that, that spice characteristic really comes in. Like I get it on the side of my palate. I get all these like pepper spices, these earthy spices, this leather, this tobacco, all these vibes that are mixing in together. And I think that this wine, because it comes off so savory on the palate, it's really mm. intense. It's got this savory quality to it. You can start to pair it with wines that don't have this, uh, sorry, with food that doesn't have that almost meaty, super savory vibe to it. So this is a wine that I think would go perfectly with vegetarian food. And I think of the vegetarian mm -hmm. foods of Spain. I'm looking at some all, some spicy olives or even some croquetas with mushroom mm -hmm. inside would be really delicious. I love oh. croquetas. They're one of my you favorite dishes ever. <laughs> I'm They're honestly tapas. like kryptonite. <laughs> Yeah. They totally uh, are. Manchego they, they cheese would also be really mm -hmm. good. And some tomato bread. You can really go all out with this type of wine and, and lean into that Spanish tapas vibe. Have a couple of different vegetarian dishes with it. But you know what? There's also enough tannic support in here to go with a little bit of a meteor aspect. You can have some chorizo with it. You can probably even do some mm -hmm. octopus with it too, which has a meteor texture yeah. and consistency. This is a very food friendly wine, but it's food friendly in a way that you can mix and match. Mixing and matching, not just sticking yeah. to one dish for the evening is, is a quintessential Spanish style. I'm glad you liked the wine, Mackenzie. I loved it. <laughs> No, it's really tasty. It's really tasty. And you were you're mentioning that like octopus in that uh, paella is another dish that's quite typical of the Valencia region. Uh, so that could be another one to throw in there. It's got chicken, it's got mussels, it's got shrimp, like it's really such a, a variety plate uh, that you can enjoy. I would love some that. I would love some paella with this. Maybe I'll cook some up. And if you guys want to give that a try at home too, you can find the Anciago, the Anciano Classico Granacha on the shelves of the LCBO. Right, Mackenzie, we have run to the end of our tasting this evening, and this has been so much fun to tour the Mediterranean with you. I want to be outside right now. I want to be eating my dinner outside and pairing it with these wines. And I want to remind everybody out there that if you wanted to do the same as us, you can find these wines online at lcbo.com. They also have home delivery and same-day pickup. And you can also stop by your local LCBO stores and check out their shelves and vintages section to find all of these wines. Thank you so much, Mackenzie, for joining me this evening. This has been a delight. My absolute pleasure. I love Mediterranean food and wine. So this was just the best way to spend an evening. And I can't wait to do it again soon. Cheers, Renee. Cheers. <laughs>